Bibles to John chapter 4 tonight. You know, it's kind of dangerous when, uh, and, I, and I, I hope I'm not the only one that's ever spoken that, that goes through this, but so Dave, you can nod at me, if you, or, or Brother Philippi or somebody. Um, when you find out three weeks in advance you're going to speak, then you're, you start to think about, well, what am I going to speak on? And you're, you go 15 directions, right, Dave? On, okay, I'm going to maybe, no, and then no, and then, hmm. And, and the Lord laid this passage on my heart a long time ago. The, the problem is, it's not really a problem, but if you look at John chapter 4 and you just look at this particular story in the Bible, there's about five different sermon topics that you can take or, you know, five different paths that you can go down because, well, and three of the, you know, three of the just basics are you got the woman at the well story, you've got the ministry of the Holy Spirit doctrine throughout this passage, and you've got Jesus and what he taught the disciples that the meat, his meat was to do the will of God and to preach the gospel. So you've got three different areas you can go to, and we can't cover them all in 30 minutes. So we're going to try to do Woman at the Well tonight, and uh, Lord willing, we'll, we'll look at a couple of truths that maybe we need to be reminded about. So if you would um, follow along with me, I'm going to read John 4, verses 7 to 14 first, and then we'll go from there. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus saith unto her, If thou knowest the gift of God, and who it is that saith unto thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldst have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us this well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. You know, it's interesting that, uh, and, and that's just the beginning, uh, uh, kind of introduction. We think of many things in this passage, and one of them is this idea that was put forth in that last song, is um, when we look at, and when the unsaved world looks at life, it's what's the next thing I'm going to get? You know, this Samaritan woman was thinking, well, you know, temporal things. You're, you're looking for temporal water, and you don't have a bucket, or you don't have a way to draw the temporal water. And then, you know, when, when Jesus started speaking to her, uh, by the way, a whole other rabbit trail, the woman of Samaria and the Jewish man, so when we think about how we minister to people and who we minister to, that's, you know, that's a whole sermon in and of itself. And then Jesus tries to explain spiritual truth to someone who doesn't have the spirit of God. And as the Bible says, uh, that's foolishness and she can't comprehend it because it's spiritually discerned. So she goes back to the natural things. Um, just the state of the unsaved person. So the first thing that we're going to look at tonight is the state of the unsaved person, and we find even more evidence of that uh, in the next few verses. We, we already read verse 14. Verse 15 says, And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me the water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So she's still on that temporal thing. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband, for thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, in that thou saidst truly. 
the first thing that we need to see about the, you know, and as we witness to people, and, and it, may be our, it may be our friends, it may be our relatives, it may be a coworker. The first thing we need to see is how the world acts in its natural state. And what we see here is that the woman at the well continued to search for happiness. You know, uh, she was on her sixth man, right? And she'd been married to five of them. And she was, and, and regardless of what had happened, now think about this. Um, you know, there was marriage, divorce, there's got to be pain inflicted there with divorce, but then regardless of the pain that she had, she got married again for whatever reason, and then she got divorced again or the husband died perhaps. There, either way, there's going to be pain inflicted again, right? And then she goes to the third husband in the same situation, either there's divorce or there's, you know, death. Either way, there's pain again. So she goes to the fourth husband, same thing, more pain, more sorrow, more suffering. Then she goes to the fifth husband, more pain, more sorrow. So then she goes to the sixth man. What would cause someone to do that? I have a friend that I grew up with. His name is Tom. He lives or he lived growing up three doors down from me. He was from a family of like eight children. Now, one has been the mayor of our town. Uh, one uh, has been the CFO of a big company. Tom, it, it, you know, has uh, lost millions of dollars in the last eight or ten years because of the way real estate has gone. Um, he still has five boats. And he writes on Facebook about how he's going to improve his carbon footprint by getting a Prius, but he's got a 52-foot boat that's got a 16-foot Boston whaler on the top of it. And I have a really good way that he could reduce his carbon footprint, like get rid of the boats. They get one mile a gallon. Tom's on his sixth wife. You know, and, and Tom is a great example of just like this woman, he keeps chasing after what he thinks is going to make him happy. This woman continued to chase after what she thought was going to make her happy. And regardless of how many times she tried it, she kept going back to it because she thought the next time it's going to make me happy. When we think about some of the people we work with or some of the people that um, we uh, live next to and, or some of the people that are in our family and we wonder, why is it that they did that again? Or why is it that they haven't learned their lesson? Or what, you can phrase it in any number of ways, right? But the bottom line is they continue to search for happiness in the only way they know how. And apart from Christ, they are never going to find the joy and the peace that God promises to believers. And so when we, and, and sometimes we want, you know, we, we'll have these discussions, uh, you know, in our car or um, whatever, or over the dinner table, my wife will say something about one of the doctors that she works with down at the hospital, and, you know, it's, he's, for such a smart guy, he sure does such dumb things with his life. And the answer is, just like the woman at the well, he continues to look for happiness in the only way he knows how. And the woman at the well continued to look for happiness in the only way she knew how. So in her unsaved state, she acted just like an unsaved person. And it shouldn't surprise us that this is what a person without Christ is going to do. All right, that's the first thing. Now, the second thing is when unsaved people talk about religion, their emphasis is always going to be wrong. Look at verses 19 to 22. After Jesus confronted her with this truth that, you know, she was living 
an improper lifestyle. Verse 19, the woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. That's an interesting, you know, interesting way to comment. But she's, she is saying here, I, I understand that you're a prophet. And then she launches in to religion. Verse 20, our fathers worshipped in this mountain. And you say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when you shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Verse 22a, you worship, ye know not what. The unsaved person, when they start talking about religion, emphasize the wrong things. And I'm afraid sometimes, even as Christians, we can fall into the same trap because she started talking about where we should worship. You know, um, you know, we're talking, you ever get in a religious conversation with people and they're going to, you know, start talking about interesting sidebars. It is not, now here's the punchline, it's not going to do with the relationship with Christ. It's going to do with all the peripheral things that have to do with religion. It might be, um, well, you baptize, you're in a Baptist church. That means you, you dunk them, right? You know, they may say something like that. Or they may say, you know, I noticed that people really dress up when they go to your church on Sunday morning. I wouldn't feel comfortable going to a church where I had to put a tie on or where I had to wear a dress. Or they might say any number of other things. The rabbit trail that the Samaritan woman got taken off of was, where is the proper place to worship? And it's interesting, isn't it, that when we talk to people who are unsaved about the gospel, they will often want to talk about religion, but they will not want to talk about their personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Or they will talk about religion, but they won't even acknowledge that they need a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. The Samaritan woman was caught up in the Samaritans worship on this mountain and Jews worship on this mountain. So which one is right? And Jesus, a verse later says, time's going to come when there's not going to be a mountain to worship on. Uh, I was fortunate enough this last weekend to go up to Minnesota. We had a, a high school or youth group reunion. Seventy people came from all over the place, Michigan and the Carolinas, Virginia. Um, and um, it was amazing. We kind of took a poll. Um, none of those people had ever gone back for their high school reunion. They had gone back for a youth group reunion. You know, there were people who, one, one of the gals that was there, her husband, until he died last year, was a missionary in Mexico. He was the one from our youth group. She came from Bradenton, Florida, to Minnesota to be with those Christian people. And you know what? They worshiped God in Mexico. Uh, the most spiritual part of our whole night on Saturday night was at a campfire in blue jeans with tennis shoes on. And we were probably, you know, that was probably the most edifying service I've been to in quite a while. You know, God probably spoke to my heart more in that service then, uh, you know, maybe in, and maybe it was my fault that it was this way, but, you know, the fact that I didn't have a tie on, you know, maybe the Holy Spirit could get, you know, from here up to there, I don't know. Um, but the people that went to the wilds, you know, they went, they had all kinds of preaching services at the wilds, and they didn't dress up for them. But sometimes we'll major on, well, how do we dress to go to church? Now, I believe, by the way, that you should dress up to go to church. 
Because, and, and young people, just listen to this one for a second. Let me ask it to you this way. What are you going to wear at your wedding? Are you going to dress up? Or are you going to just put on a T-shirt? And that's going to be cool. Why do you dress up? You dress up because it shows respect or it shows the importance of the day. And back when I was your age, to use a, a phrase that you've heard before, um, people had a couple sets of clothes many times. Back when the closets in the houses were 30 inches wide, you only needed about three sets of hanging clothes. You had your Sunday clothes, and then you had your work clothes. By the way, when, back in those days, we didn't have showers, so you took a bath, and you always took a bath on Saturday night because you had to be dressed in your good clothes for Sunday morning. And you didn't want to soil them, so you always took your bath on Saturday night. So I believe in dressing up, but what I'm saying is it doesn't matter what style of clothes we're in. God can minister to us if we're in a blue, you know, blue jeans and a T-shirt just as much as he can minister to us if we're in a suit and tie. And this lady was wondering, well, where is God going to minister to us? Is he going to minister to us in this spot? Or is he going to minister to us in this spot? Or is he going to minister to us in this spot? And the reason for that was her emphasis was in the wrong place. Her emphasis was not on her relationship with Christ or her relationship to God through Christ. Her emphasis was on the practice of religion. And that doesn't get anybody, anybody anywhere with God. Uh, we need to be careful that you know, we might clean up and look great on Sunday morning, but we might have the dirtiest heart. As, as Jesus said, we might have that, you know, open sepulcher. We might not have our heart right with God. We can fall into the same trap. And many times, if we've got a, if, you know, if we're, uh, you know, stiff-necked and stubborn, and when God is speaking to our hearts, we don't respond to him, that's exactly how we get. You know, we... Uh, Forget about our relationship with God at the time, and we look in the mirror and say, okay, do I look good enough to go to church? So we can fall into the same trap, but the person who's unsaved is going to naturally fall into this trap because they aren't going to want to emphasize their standing before God and their relationship with Christ. All right, now the third thing, is that true salvation yields a change. And we're not going to read every verse uh, through the 32 verses of, of this story, but let's look down at chapter 4, verses 28, 29, and 30, and then verse 39. It says, The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come see a man which told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Skip down to verse 39. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him for the saying of the woman which testified. He told me all that ever I did. A couple things we want to see here. First of all, true salvation yields a change. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We've probably all at some point memorized and rememorized that verse. But it's true. When the Samaritan woman accepted Christ as her personal Messiah, she dropped her water pot and went to the men of the city and gave them what testimony she could. A couple things here. First of all, she'd been saved what? Ten minutes? Maybe less? Maybe a half hour if it took a long time for her to, you know, walk. But the, but the thing is, she was saved a very, very short time. 
And she didn't know all of the Romans' road, did she? And yet she could still be a witness for Christ because she could just point other people to Jesus and is not this the Messiah? She gave her personal testimony. He told me all things that ever I did. That's all she knew. She didn't know all of the doctrines. She hadn't gone to four years of uh, Bible college. She hadn't been formally trained in, in preaching. By the way, she was a woman, right? I'm not saying women should have the pulpit, but I'm saying that women can serve God and lead others to Christ just like men can, right? And all she did was go to those people and say, I think I've just found the Messiah. Come and find out. And what does verse 39 say? Many people from that town accepted Jesus because of the testimony of that woman. Now, later on in chapter 4, the men say, um, you know, you told us about him, but we, had, we found out for ourselves, and, you know, we, there's a lot of discussion about what that means, but the bottom line is verse 39 is in the Bible. And it says that those people got saved. Why? Because of the testimony of the Samaritan woman, the person that had been saved for less than an hour, and all she did was tell others about what God did for her. Sometimes we try to make it too hard. We try to make it too complex. You know, we've got people at, again, at work or maybe people in our family, and it's okay, well, how are we going to witness to them? Many times, all we need to do is tell them, this is what Jesus has done for me. This is what God has done for me. Now, there's... Obviously, way more to it than that, but that's a place to start. And, you know, you can, you can do that just like this person did the moment you got saved. And I think many times people who just get saved, um, as soon as they have that new life in Christ, they want to tell somebody about it. And she dropped her water pot and forgot about what she had come for and took up her own cross, and serve the Lord. Now, why is that possible? And I'm going to just leave you with this thought, and then we'll be done today. It's possible because salvation is the miracle of God. Take a, a, a second to go over to 1 Peter chapter 1. We're just going to read a couple of verses here about salvation. Again, thinking about this idea that salvation is a miracle of God. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 says this, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves but unto us they did minister all things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost. Listen to this last part. Sent down from heaven which things the angels desire to look into now here's the picture verse 10 of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently end of chapter or verse 12 of which things the angels desire to look into salvation's a miracle when we ask is does god still do miracles in our Lifetime, the answer is every time a person gets saved, it's a miracle of God. Verse 12 here says this the angels look over the rim of heaven to watch it to watch it happen. You see what the see what that last little phrase says there at the end of verse 12? I'm going to read it one more time. Of which things the angels desire to look into. Now, think about this. You're in heaven. And everything in heaven 
is just as it's been told to us it's going to be. Streets of gold in the presence of God. The angels are there. All right? What could be better than that? If I want to participate in something, participating in heaven is pretty good. Right? What does it say in verse 12? The angels desire to look into it. Salvation. Verse 10. If you look at 10, 11, and 12, the angels of God wanted or desired to look into salvation, which the prophets investigated thoroughly. Why? Because they wanted to understand the miracle of God. So the prophets, they wanted to study it. The angels just wanted to watch. Because salvation is the miracle of God. So when we wonder, what could have caused this Samaritan woman who had been uh, living in an adulterous relationship and had been married to five other men before she was in this adulterous relationship... What would possess her to drop her water pot and go back to town and tell all the people there the minute she saw them that she just met the Messiah? And the answer is really simple. She was a participant in the miracle of God, which is salvation. And it's such a big deal that the angels who live in heaven want to watch too. All right, so... Having said that, how about us? Question number one, do we take our salvation for granted? I know some of us could give testimonies in here about how many years that they've been saved. And it's great to have been saved many, many years. Some of us could talk about how we used to live and what our lifestyle was before we accepted the Lord and now we live a different kind of lifestyle. Those are both good things. But the question is still, do we take our salvation for granted? I know I do. I, I uh, you know, think about my life and I think about the lives of people that I've grown up with and I think about uh, the lives of people that I see walking down the street or that I rub shoulders with, whatever. And there are many times that I'm too calloused. I don't share the gospel with those people. I don't, I don't act like I should. I don't act like my salvation is a miracle. I act more like the natural man, I'm afraid, sometimes than a spiritual person. And, you know, there are, there are others that, you know, that, and there's debate, debate, debate about, well, how much change do I need to have to show that I'm a Christian? It should be exactly the opposite. It should be, uh, you know, not how much change do I have to endure so I can show I'm a Christian. It's like, God, you got, you've got my whole life now. Like this Samaritan woman who dropped what she was doing and started witnessing immediately. Why? Because... Salvation brought about a change in her life, and that salvation is a miracle of God. We need to remember that each and every day. Let's close in prayer, and then we'll break up into prayer groups.